Welcome everyone to a look at the Algorand 2024 roadmap. I'm your host, Ryan Fox, Head of Developer Relations here at Algorand Foundation. I'm joined today by three of my colleagues here at Algorand. John J.J. Giannotti, Head of Applied Research at Algorand Technologies. Alessandro Capoletto, Head of Product at Algorand Foundation. And John Woods, Chief Technology Officer at Algorand Foundation. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you, Ryan. Nice to be here. Uh, it's always good to be here with you guys. So uh, thanks once again for uh, doing this. So I'm looking around here at the three of you. Uh, anybody chess players here amongst you? I, I, I play, but I'm terrible. All right. So are, are, are you the one who's responsible oh, for it? Yes. For, all right, good. <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. All right, so all three of you are responsible for putting this term gambit into our roadmap this year then, huh? Is that how this came to be? So uh, I think, you know, I have to say the uh, the concept came from um, someone within the marketing team at, at, the, at the foundation. And I, I thought it was, straight away, I thought it was like really interesting. I thought it was like the intersection of something a little bit sexy, a little bit, a little bit cerebral, uh, but also something that I thought uh, had the the hook for people to kind of latch onto. And, and uh, I think there's, you know, some, uh, some projects within the Web3 space that do this quite well, that name their releases, uh, that kind of give folks uh, catchy names to kind of propagate and, 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 and meme across the ecosystem. And uh, I thought they did a great job with this one. It's, it's really quite cool. I think so as well. Uh, so for context, right, Gambit is an opening move in chess that sometimes entails a degree of risk but it's calculated to gain an advantage. So that's the part that I found fairly intriguing. So uh, John Woods, uh, are there any key elements contained within the 2024 Algorand roadmap that are calculated to gain Algorand an advantage? Um, I would say absolutely all of it has been uh, calculated um, mischievously to, to try to, um, to give Algorand, um, I guess, a competitive advantage. When I look at Algorand, I think if you had looked at it uh, a year ago, one might have said, hey, you know, the protocol's in pretty great shape, but the developer experience wasn't great. Um, or certainly it wasn't as good as we wanted it to be. And so since then, under Alessandro's leadership at the Algorand Foundation as head of product, um, we've brought AlgoKit to the market. Um, of course, this has evolved over the last kind of year and a half or so. Um, from version one to version two, which we're going to be releasing um, next month. And it's been, I think, a tectonic shift in the experience of developing applications uh, for JJ's very wonderful AVM, which I've said before is the Apple Silicon of the blockchain space. So the AVM is fast and efficient. It's precise. And it's a great platform on which to execute your smart contracts. But of course, you've got to instruct the AVM and tell it what to do. And just like any virtual computer or any virtual CPU, it has an instruction set. And it also has an assembly-like language in Teal. And, and Teal is pretty great, um, but it's quite low level. And we wanted to make sure that we provided people who are used to more high-level regular development environments and, and experiences the tools and the languages that, that, that they needed to be successful um, and to bring things to market quickly in a way that is maintainable uh, in a cost-effective fashion. And AlgoKit is that. It's everything you need to build, test, and deploy applications on Algorand, whilst at the same time getting out of the way, okay? Allowing you to focus on your on your business logic. And so um, with this roadmap, we extend that vision and we bring Python, one of the most popular programming languages in the world, uh, to Algorand. And so now this is one of the most inclusive and important steps we've taken in the Algorand development journey. And this will enable people all over the world of all levels of capability with computer engineering uh, to bring their vision uh, to the Algorand platform. And uh, I'll let my, my colleagues speak on some of the other points. But if you look across uh, the broad theme of this gambit, it is making the UX sing, increasing uh, the decentralization of the network with peer-to-peer. -peer. And of course, um, when we look at the technologies like consensus incentives, which is both a philosophical and technological change, uh, we are focusing on, again, decentralization, security, and uh, sustainability of the network. All right, very good. Well, we've got uh, five different topics that we're going to cover. So I have uh, assembled uh, questions from our community over the last couple of weeks as we've led up to this. And I've tried to uh, summarize them and there won't be direct questions, but uh, you know, I'll paraphrase them in and uh, hand them out to each of you guys. So 
JJ, I'm going to look in your direction first. How's that? Uh, so here at Algorand, we've got uh, one consensus protocol and we've got one set of dev tooling. We've got two companies here and they work independently on this roadmap. So tell us, uh, how do you guys manage to collaborate on all these different efforts throughout 2024? Yeah, so, well, one thing is it's not as independent as all that. We we talk to each other constantly, um, and we, we do certainly collaborate on, um, uh, you know, changes and, and how things are going to fit together. But the other point, um, I think John, in a way, already brought this up by, by, by comparing DAVM to an instruction set. Um, just as, let's say, the Linux kernel is developed by a bunch of guys who don't care at all about how the Python interpreter uh, works, um, we also have sort of a kernel space and user space. So think of the AVM and, and transaction processing in general as the kernel. Um, and you know, it, it provides a set of primitives that can be accessed by, um, by higher level uh, software. And then AlgoKit takes advantage of those uh, interfaces. And when we collaborate, we often, we, we might collaborate. And I think I'll, I'll end up mentioning, talking a little bit more about this later. Um, you know, I, I think there'll be places where the, just the right hook between those two worlds uh, really improves the world, really improves the whole system. But, uh, but a nice thing is that each can be continue to be developed relatively independently. So, so we collaborate uh, on a lot of things, but there's plenty of stuff that, um, you know, AlgoKit can be developed, uh, you know, if I'm doing my job properly, AlgoKit can be developed mostly without uh, asking for changes in the API and so on. Right. So um, we work together when we need to, but, I, but uh, you know, if we're doing our job properly, things are separated, separate enough that um, progress can be made uh, independently. All right. On like initiatives, when we think about this roadmap, you know, it's, it's, it's combined bit for Algorand, the protocol, right? But who's driving those initiatives and, and, and where does Silvio factor into those decisions and discussions? So Silvio, um, I would say he's more on the, uh, let's call it what I just called the kernel space. So he's, he uh, talks to me, to us, um, probably more than he talks to the AlgoKit developers. Um, so he was a big part of the incentive design. Um, so there are some changes from our original perspective, uh, his original perspective, um, but those are um, changes that you know, happen over time as, you, as the world works a little bit differently than you expect. Uh, you know, we're, we're four or five years in and um, it, you know, some, some changes happen, but, uh, but Silvio is involved in that. Uh, you know, I don't think we're going to get into every little detail of what we've implemented for incentives, but um, I can sort of point point by point. This this was Silvio's idea. This was my idea. This was <laughs> this was Paul's idea, um, and um, you know, we all work together on that. So. Great. Appreciate the insights into uh, how the sausage gets made. Right. Good stuff. Alessandro, all right, let's let's talk devs here, right? I'm a, I'm a dev. You're the product guy. JJ's over there pumping out cool new features, right, for AlgoKit for or for for the AVM and uh, packing them into uh, AlgoKit, right? So that devs like me can actually use these tools to build fully functioning decentralized applications in Algorand, doing that with ease and of course doing it at scale. So, what do you have in store for us in 2024 for dev tooling, and most importantly, when AlgoKit 2.0? Okay, so well, first and foremost, let me say that we stand on top of the shoulders of giants. Uh, most of what AlgoKit is, is built on top of the monumental work the Algorand technology team does. And it's without them, AlgoKit wouldn't be as good as it is. So you're a dev. We have a lot of nice things um, coming this year. Uh, First and foremost, AlgoKit 2.0, we are almost there. Uh, Python is almost ready to go out of developer preview. We are targeting end of March as a hypothetical release window. This should fare well. I'd love to have it before Easter, Easter holiday, so that we can all rest during that holiday. <laughs> but also we have noticed that there is a difference between building in open source and building in the open. We have been building open source software since the beginning, but we now want to pull the curtain and show what's behind the scene. So something that our community should look forward is we will release or all our current year milestones. And so all the new features that are coming to AlgoKit, it will be all in the open. You can see on the whole product process, the whole study and user stories process. This is, this is something that I'm extremely 
happy about so that the community can be way more involved. Wonderful. Where where will we see that released? It, it, on GitHub. We have shifted from internal tooling to something that everyone can watch and everyone can take a look at. So GitHub on the Algon Foundation org, uh, you will find projects and you know, on all the relevant repos, the milestones. And, and maybe, Ryan, I, I'll just quickly touch on this because I think it's really important. And Alessandro uh, has been pushing to do this for some time. When we first um, launched AlgoKit, of course, it was like file, new project, right? It was a totally new new, new, new thing. We didn't fork anything and, and continue it. And so with any kind of project when you start it off, uh, it's, it's not, there's nothing much to show for the first few weeks of development or whatever, right? And so um, even when we started doing our pushes to the, to the repo, right, as he says, it was open source in, in, in code, but not in development. And what, what he's really, you know, I, I know not everyone on the call is a developer. So sorry, on, in the audience is a developer. So what he really means there is like, yeah, sure. We were releasing the code so you could read it. Anyone could, but we weren't showing the tickets. We weren't showing the backlog. We weren't showing the, the you know, the roadmap. We weren't showing the things that we were triaging or struggling with. And so now we're, we're, we're changing that paradigm. And so even the things we're working on the tickets, they are going to be, uh, as far as I understand, Alexandra, correct me if I'm wrong, they're going to be, that roadmap is going to be uh, displayed to the public. So you'll be able to see, hey, what, what are we doing this week? You know, and so yeah. that's, I think, the truest form of, of open source engineering. Of course, uh, we would love as well uh, contributions from, from the outside. So it's not a case of like, you know, look at the code, but please don't don't tell us what to do. If you have ideas, come make, make PRs, we'll accept them. Um, and so we are embracing this uh, philosophically and technically. Yeah, the fundamental thought process behind it is we are building this for the community. So the sooner they can see what's going on and what can happen, the better we can shape the product around their necessities. Wonderful. Uh, JJ, looking at you, uh, similar outreach for um, having devs come in and contribute to Go Algorand and the related repositories, just the same? Yeah, absolutely. We've Go Algorand has always been on GitHub, uh, issues on GitHub. Uh, uh, PRs are on GitHub. Uh, you can watch me implement incentives if you'd like, um, and uh, comment. People have people. Absolutely, I respond. I enjoy yep. I enjoy conversations on GitHub. Appreciate it. Wonderful. Yeah, I I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm 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 looking always ahead at what JJ's got coming in 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 the ABM. There's some uh, there's some exciting things in, uh, in in the future. So I always like to to pull and and, and build that. Alessandro, I'm thrilled to see that you guys are going to uh, move this and, and start to show us exactly what's coming. Uh, and the invitation is there, devs, out there. Uh, this is an open source project. We want you to contribute. So please do just that. And maybe Alessandro, Ryan, I, I just, just, sorry, just had one last thing on what JJ said, because I think it's important. And, and it's not something that's addressed very often, because normally we don't talk this technical. When, you, when, you're, when you're developing something as, as sophisticated as, as, say, the AVM or like the virtual CPU at the heart of Algorand uh, or the consensus algorithm or the cryptography or the other parts of the network stack that, that AlgoD uh, is, it's very difficult sometimes uh, to accept contributions uh, from people outside of the core, pro of, of the core development team because um, normally when you're going back and forth, when someone, when someone basically contributes something, you've got to triage the code, make sure it's okay, have someone review, do a lot of dialogue, merge it, on a branch, make sure that it's performing okay. And it's a lot easier to do that with people you've worked with for like five years than it is today to do with a new contributor, no matter how technically great that the new contributor is. Also, there's there's nuance in, in something as sophisticated as AlgoD, which is uh, sometimes even with great code contributors is not maybe seen or there's, there's side effects that maybe a person wouldn't realize. And so um, I, I know uh, I've seen this when I was at Cardano and, and of course now in Algorand, I know people sometimes go, well, I made a PR and I thought it was pretty good and I didn't get accepted into the core node. And and we will be, as we move forward, be trying to incorporate more of people's uh, uh, you know contributions because the future of development is decentralized. It can't just always be mm -hmm. a set of team at, uh, at the Inc. But at the same time, just to set that expectation that uh, if you felt that you contributed, but it, it, it didn't get the maybe the appreciation it deserved, it's only because the team are trying to move forward really quickly and to work with open source contributions, it, it really materially slows the development uh, process. Appreciate those insights, John. Uh, Alessandro, so wanted to ask you, you chose uh, Python as the canonical language for AlgoKit 2.0. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the design considerations and uh, and the reasoning behind that? Well, uh, a few reasons. First, uh, one, the the ecosystem itself was already used to Pythonic style language with PyTL being here before and predating official Python. That was 
if you never try to alienate your your end users, uh, those who at at the end of it uh, of the process use your product. So this was the first reason, and the second reason was the wide popularity and adoption Python has at all levels of a developer funnel. Uh, in the past years, Python has started to being the predominant language in ComSci 101 courses. Uh, it has replaced Java on this. So everyone coming up with some sort of computer science education has encountered Python uh, at at least one step of their career. So this was the core idea behind it was Python is easy to write. It's fairly easy to read. Uh, it's a bit convoluted in setting up the environment. That's where the initial effort on AlgoKit was focused. And that's why it was focused there. Uh, but yeah, it's everyone knows Python. Even if they think they don't know it, you, if you speak English pretty much, you're halfway there. And it, that was it the is a very thing. conversational like it's, language. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And the more people you can have at the top of the funnel, uh, the the better the chances you have that you will mold a brand new algorithm developer. Love it. All right. Very good. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm very excited about it. I'm I'm pleased that you are reaching this very, very broad audience uh, with, with Python and Alga 2.0. If you haven't, developers, checked out the developer preview, which has been out since December, you better go and do that, and you better go and do it now. You can get to uh, developer.algorand.org slash algokit, and you can get the direct link to get it downloaded, get it installed. John, wondering if you think Alessandro's ready to share any alpha on the next language algokit might support. Well, you know, there's nothing I like more than to hype. So, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> All right. All right. Seems to be in for a treat. Uh, always following with the key principles I highlighted first uh, before. The second most popular language, let's say, is JavaScript. And we have seen with the with the huge effort, uh, our DevRel and fellow colleagues, Joe, uh, what he's done this past year, he has been piloting TealScript, which is a TypeScript uh, version of of a smart contract programming language for Algorand. And we uh, we built uh, the Puya compiler stack to be to accept multiple frontends. So the realization of the initial work we started with that compiler will be to add yet another language. This means we will be bringing TypeScript, more specifically TillScript, um, we will be porting it to the Puya compiler stack. And this will mean that the front ends will be different, but all the optimizations we make within the in compiler stack will translate to both languages uh, at the same time. So this is a streamlining maintenance and streamlining optimization efforts. And all of a sudden, it's also this will be done extremely in public so that if people want to mimic our efforts and try to port another language, they they'll see a roadmap and the step-by-step -step process so yeah officially really? typescript will be coming to algorand we'll start the work uh later in the year it's it's but i have it's... to say you know, just just one just two things i want i want to mention uh first could it get any better you got python and typescript i mean they're the two simplest languages in the world okay it's it's, it's really will it, it it opens it to everyone Number two, I want to touch on something Alexandro said uh, because he's dealing with this stuff every day, and so he's he's used to it. But uh, I want to I want to explain it to people a little bit more. We have made uh, with our with our engineering partners a pipeline, okay, uh, like a pizza pipeline, where at different stages different things happen. And so in a you know maybe you cook the base, you add the sauce, you add the toppings, you cook it all, and then it goes out, right? And so what what they've done is that they can screw on a front end language. Okay, and that could be Python, it might be TypeScript, it might be Swift, it might be C, it might be Rust. And these sections after that, the pipeline for, for, the, for the language, the optimization stage isn't there because that's what it's doing. Inside, inside the pipeline, it's not cooking the pizza, it's optimizing the code. That is agnostic to the front-end language. The front-end language gets transferred to this intermediate language, a la LLVM by Chris Lattner, um, 
uh, at Apple, and then it basically, uh, uh, you know, um, optimizes, 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 and what gets spit out at the end is just like LLVM, a target bytecode. In this case, AVM bytecode that it can be executed, or teal, and then finally AVM bytecode after compilation, and so. We have now this pipeline. So 80% of what we've done, I'm pulling that number a little bit out of the year, but like the, the majority of what we've built for Python is being reused here. We're reusing all of the language pipeline, the, 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 the parser, the, the, the lexer, the, the abstract syntax tree, all the optimization stages. We're reusing all of that. And all we got to do is screw on Joe's uh, wonderfully innovative uh, teal script, you know, Python, uh, TypeScript um, syntax. And so we're going to put that on the front. And so this is not only reuse of things we've already uh, paid for and, and built, but it's also going to enable not just uh, Python and TypeScript, but f but in the future, folks will be able to bring their own languages to this pipeline. Hmm. And so uh, we couldn't be more excited. It doesn't get any better than this. Looking forward. All right. Uh, wonderful that we will be able to have all these uh, additional languages coming to us. Uh, Alessandro, like, when we take a look at AlgoKit and kind of its evolution from basically just a command line tool to where it is today and looking forward at the developer preview to where it, where it's going, um, debugging has had quite an evolution over time. And I think that you've got a lot of things that are coming in the roadmap uh, this year for that. Could you touch on a little bit about what that developer experience is going to look like in AlgoKit 2.0. So in December, uh, also thanks to the work at made by the Algorand Technologies team, we have released a teal debugger. Uh, a debugging feature was probably the most requested feature that we had in AlgoKit. Of course, you write code, you need to debug it. No one's perfect. No one writes code, the correct code first time around. So we have done where we have the teal debugger now we during this year it's and from starting from 2.0 onwards we will focus on mapping that teal debug uh, session uh, to python so that you will have high level language debugging uh, enabled so that we are minimizing the need of understanding teal because we we recognize it's it's a low level language not everyone is willing to go that deep. Uh, so uh, mapping it to a, a higher level language should yield a, a better experience. So Python line by line debugging is one of the goals this year. Appreciate that. Yeah, th I think that that's very important to be able to reason about what your high level language code is doing, because oftentimes it is more difficult to reason about what uh, what a low level language is is uh, trying to accomplish there. So looking forward to all of that. JJ, I'm going to turn it over to you as we wrap up this uh, AlgoKit section of our 2024 roadmap. And I want to ask you a little bit about AVM 10, which just was released as this roadmap was coming out. So in there, you dropped us in a bunch of crypto op codes. And I'm curious what you know, kind of why, why, why did you add these to the AVM and, and what are you expecting are going to be built uh, with those going forward? Yeah. So first, this is a great example of community contribution. This uh, going, going back quite a ways, but this uh, started out as a community PR, uh, the, these opcodes. Uh, we expanded it. So just to, to John's point about how we will often take a contribution and massage it quite a bit before it's ready. You know, we we, we got things audited. We we added uh, support for more curves. But the point here is that we've added opcodes for um, dealing with elliptic curves and in particular pairs of elliptic curves that are, are called pairing friendly. Um, and so we've put in the primitive opcodes to, to allow you to add them and multiply them and check for, pair, for pairing operations. And what do we expect people to be able to do with that? That really enables two pairing friendly cur curves enable two interesting things. Um, one is you can check ZK proofs. So um, this means that it's uh, reasonable to expect that people can generate ZK proofs of something uh, off chain and send it to a uh, 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 an Algorand app and have the app confirm the check the ZK proof. Uh, the other thing that I know some people are interested in um, is uh, something called BLS signatures. Um, these are signatures that are aggregatable. Um, and what that means is that you can have many, many signatures um, and sort of pump them all to push them all, squish them all together and perform one check and confirm that they're all they're all correct. 
Um, and that also has some, some nice properties for privacy um, because you, I think you can't tell who signed it. Um, so both of those, both of those uh, things come from the fact that, the, that we can now operate on pairing friendly curves um, and we're supporting two curves, uh, BN254, which is um, uh, sort of for compatibility because it's a, um, that's available on Ethereum. Um, and so it's nice to support the same curve, uh, even though people don't think that BN254 is quite as secure as it originally thought it was. Um, I think people think it's got about 112 bits of security instead of 128 or something like that. Um, and then there's BLS12381, which is sort of the, the, the current hotness and plenty, secu plenty secure. Um, uh, so, so we support both of those curves. Um, all of the operations can be applied to any, either of those curves. Um, and um, and that's, a, that's a, a very common example of when uh, something needs to be, uh, an addition needs to happen in the ABM. In theory, I suppose, you could have implemented uh, these operations uh, using the existing ABM opcodes. It would have been incredibly slow and ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what, one of the reasons why we add an opcode to the ABM is when there's some operation that we know is extremely expensive and we want to run it in native code. Um, and so that's uh, why we do that. Um, another example of what we add to the ABM that also is in ABM 10 um, is when there's something that's incredibly awkward um, in the ABM. It's not quite as CPU intensive, but to implement it in um, in Teal or Teal Script or Python uh, would have been would have led to bloated bytecode, and that's the box the box splice and box resize opcodes. Um, and we added those because in the ABM you can only manipulate. Um, relatively small chunks of data uh, up to 4K um, with the normal opcodes, but boxes are allowed to be considerably bigger than 4K. Uh, and so if you needed to move things around inside of a large box, you had to do it by pulling things in and pulling things out and moving, you know, um, looping around and doing a lot of complicated stuff. Uh, and the box splice allows you to perform some of these operations uh, in one opcode that we can then just do rapidly in native code. So those are the kinds of things that um, are going in the AVM these days. Uh, things that if we if you had implemented them bytecode by bytecode, you would have been in for uh, code bloat and 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 slowdowns. I appreciate that. Then uh, looking forward, what do you what do you got uh, in the hopper right now? What what are you working on for the future? So my development time right now is a little bit more on incentives than on the AVM, but there's a couple of things that I have uh, queued sort of that I think are important and, and I have a pretty good idea how to do some of them. Um, one of those, the main two things that people, the thing that I've always done, so the AVM, yeah, it was kind of you to say that I wrote the AVM. Uh, I didn't really, um, it, it existed in some form before I even got to Algorand as a, as a bytecode interpreter. Um, uh, but it was not turn complete at the time. Uh, so I, 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 I changed it from being called Teal to being called the AVM and, and, and having all this extra power. And I, what I've always tried to do is at relieve limits that, that, that were placed intentionally at the beginning to ensure safety and relieve them slowly and carefully to make sure that we're still just as safe and just as fast. Um, so one of the things that I want to do is do that again and do that more um, so that you can execute more code. I, I suspect that, um, especially with the use of high-level languages like, like Python uh, being compiled down to the, to the AVM, people are going to run into these limits um, sooner rather than later. Um, and so I want to give people more opcode budget um, and possibly larger programs um, soon. The more opcode budget, I think I see a simple way forward. Um, and um, bigger programs will, might be a little bit more complex. Uh, but uh, that's what I want to do. I want to make it so that you can write these bigger programs using these higher level languages. Uh, I may not be involved in, in compiling the high level language, but uh, by talking to the high level language implementers and figuring out what small new opcodes they might need, um, I have an idea for a looping opcode that will would significantly decrease uh, uh, opcode budget use um, that they would probably be interested in. Um, so things, things along those lines. Trying to, right. trying to speed things up and allow for bigger programs. This uh, is music to my ears, JJ. So thanks. <laughs> thanks I, was for going, I was going to say the same thing. Dev, that this is one of the biggest things that I hear from Dev. So yes, looking forward. Can't wait to see it. JJ, that, he, Alexander's right. That is so soothing. You should do a podcast so we can we can like listen to it as we fall asleep into a beautiful dream. It's <laughs> cool. more budget. Everybody it's, should know. You can get a lot of budget by using Logic 6. Boy, Logic yeah, yeah. 6 has so much budget. It's one of the first things JJ taught me. 
about AVM was that if you chain logic SIGs, you can do you can do a hell of a lot of stuff. Oh, in the actually, that went into AVM ten. It used to be um, that you would have to put a, your code in a whole bunch of separate logic SIGs. Now you can use one logic SIG that uses the logic SIG budget across the whole group. Uh, that was kind of necessary for these pairing friendly op codes. They're extremely expensive. Um, just that's even even running native code. They're they're slow. Um, so you have to you sort of have to do this over the over course of several object logic SIGs. You know, I, I'm I'm so excited about those pairing pairing instructions because you know, as JJ already said, the ability to do equivalence checks uh, in the extension field and tower uh, extension towers and other things, these are, these are heavy math primitives which are very computationally intensive, which is why you have to chain chain like this to get the budget to use them. But they allow you to do some 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 incredible things, uh, you know, homomorphic things, uh, aggregate signatures, a whole lot of stuff that opens up, uh, you know, um, trustless oracles. Um, ZKPs, a whole lot of really groovy things. And so, uh, again, to have these kind of things as, as an instruction in the AVM, as a low-level thing you can ask the CPU to do, uh, is, is incredible. Um, and it joins other things like ECDSA Verify and other cool opcodes that are already there that enable things like account, account abstraction and, and other things like that. So uh, the AVM has really reached a level of sophistication, which is um, very powerful. Absolutely. Looking forward to that. Well, John, I, I know you came here from Cardano because you came here for the great tech. You came here for instant finality and making sure that we can build robust and fast decentralized applications. Now, what I didn't realize is that you were going to be bringing the memes. Man, dynamic Lambos? Really? What are we talking about here? Come on, really. Tell yeah. us what do you mean when you say dynamic Lambos? And let's talk, uh, let's talk about decentralization here. Thanks for bringing the memes up, Ryan. You know, I do try to entertain the community as best I can. Um, so, yes, Dynamic Lambos, of course. Uh, actually, I think it was Alessandro's idea, Dynamic Lambos, was it? I, I saw it on Twitter. Okay, okay, so, okay. On Twitter. Formerly known as Twitter. Oh, I think it was Angel on Twitter. It was his idea, actually. I All think. right. Okay. Well, yeah, Dynamic Lambos, it's our nickname for Dynamic Lambda. Uh, what is Dynamic Lambda, of course? Uh, it is essentially um, speeding up the block time on Algorand by choosing not to wait for some slowest percentage of, of, of uh, votes and proposers. And so um, by kind of saying, hey, you know, uh, we could wait to get 100% of people on this bus, but we, we can kind of probably take off now with 95% of the people on the bus and we'll get there a lot sooner. Uh, we, we've made that kind of optimization. And so, of course, you would never want to leave uh, with the bus with 10% of the people on it because that would be uh, no good. Um, but by kind of, you know, slicing off that, that kind of, uh, slowest fifth uh, fifth percentile or slowest third percentile or whatever, you, you get to a place where you get a high level of optimization and efficiency, in this case, reducing the block time uh, from over three seconds to around 2.8 um, without sacrificing any any real security or any, or, or, or any real, um, or having any real side effect. Uh, JJ, would you say that that's a fair assessment of it? Or do you have anything to add more technically? Yeah, f fair, but perhaps even not uh, strong enough. So okay. there are no changes to security. So it's not like we're saying, let's ignore some people because it probably won't matter. Uh, it can't matter. So the only thing that's being changed here is that um, in the first step of the protocol, all the nodes have to wait until they see the best VRF claim. Um, oh, I just lost my webcam. Uh, well, maybe it'll come back. Uh, there it is. Um, so they have to wait until they see the best VRF claim. Um, and they always used to wait the same amount of time, no matter what. And we noticed that the internet's perhaps faster than we originally expected. Um, and so we found that all that a node could vote early. Um, and look, if it votes too early, then we're going to end up in the next round of the protocol, and we're still going to get all the same security claims that we ever had. But instead, but by watching and keeping track of how 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 long it usually takes to see the best possible claim, you can vote early when you're pretty sure you've seen the best possible claim. Again, if you're wrong, we'll move on to the next round of the protocol. Um, but if you're right, then the whole round gets to gets to finalize faster. Um, and so each node now is keeping track of what they've seen in the last uh, 20 or so rounds. How quickly have they seen the best possible claim? Um, and they say, well, usually I see the best possible claim after this long. So I'm going to vote after that long plus a little fudge factor. Um, and we put in a minimum uh, number uh, value here that the that the um, that computation can go down to, and we've been pretty conservative with it. And that's why you've seen the increase that you have. But you've, if you have noticed, the increase has been very constant. It's because the real number is lower. So we can probably make this faster uh, safely, but we do this stuff kind of stuff conservatively. So uh, the internet's pretty fast, um, and and our and our high stake nodes are connected to fast connections. So. All the nodes are, are currently deciding, oh, I can vote a lot faster than I originally expected. So I'm going to vote faster and we're going to get through it. 
Cool. So, so as as this uh, protocol is defined right now, will we continue to see it uh, eke itself down, or is there are we are we already at its its final amount, and there would be another consensus? Like we think that it could go faster. Yeah. So right now, right now there's a consensus parameter that is the lowest they're allowed okay. to guess. Um, their calculations are are arriving at a lower number, and so therefore they're mm -hmm. all hitting this this minimum. And so two things are possible. Um, one thing is that we just pick a, a slightly lower number to be that minimum, and then rounds will sort of step function down and go faster. Uh, what I always thought would be fun, uh, but I, I don't know that we'd have we'd implement it, is that we could make it so that that minimum decreases slowly over time automatically without a consensus release, mm -hmm. um, and that way we would still get this slow. Uh, slowly, we'd get faster and faster, and we could be monitoring and watching and seeing seeing if there's any problems. Um, Probably we'll do it as step functions and consensus releases, but who knows? All right. And Lambo, if we, Lambo's if go we set, if, yeah, if it was set way low, JJ, that's a question, you know, rather than a statement. If it was set way low, you'd see, I guess, more up and down in the in the, in the round times. I suspect you'd see more variation, except it, I, that's what I was implying. What I said earlier, I could well be wrong. So we've we've seen numbers like one second. Like right today, if we use the numbers that were actually happening in the network, uh, mm -hmm. we'd probably have something like one second round times, which would be a little crazy. Um, but um, and, and the reason I was saying I, I might expect more variance. I was being a little bit silly because I was sort of implying, well, sometimes the internet's fast and sometimes it's slow. It's probably not. It's probably the case that almost all of our high stake nodes are well connected to pretty much constantly fast networks. Um, and so I expect maybe we wouldn't see exact, um, we wouldn't see much fluctuation, um, but we perhaps wouldn't see what we see today, which is that there's sort of a hard floor um, where we can't possibly go any faster than whatever that ends up being when, once you take into account the delay plus the extra steps that have to happen we'll call it 2.77 or something like that we can't be faster than that today okay. um, but we could if we if we lower that limit we, we'd well as, as we look forward to decentralization right it would no mm -hmm. incentive incentivization was another topic that was covered within in the in the roadmap right and if we look at that and we think about okay so we want to bring in and incentivize nodes like that might have some impact on on, on performance but um so so let's let's yeah. talk about this like so in the in the original algorand white paper, right? Silvio talked about or described, you know, essentially an, an altruistic node operation model, right? And 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 now um, this uh, in, incentivize incentivizing consensus um, introduces something different than that. So um, maybe can can John JJ can you guys talk kind of talk through kind of like why, sure. why is there Before a need for consensus? I, oh, before you do, I thought you were, wanted to point out that well, what if in the future mm -hmm. nodes are slower, not faster? Um, mm -hmm. One of the nice things about dynamic uh, dynamic Lambos uh, is that uh, <laughs> they can also slow down, right? So if uh, you know, especially once we have peer to peer stuff uh, working, if all mm -hmm. the relays were suddenly to hit by got hit by bombs, every single one of our fast relays got hit by bombs, uh, the peer to peer would still be pushing pushing out uh, votes and, and so on, uh, and so all of the nodes would notice, hey, I better wait longer than I used to wait because I'm not getting the best possible claim until later than I expected. Um, and so we'll be able to have nine second block times if we have to. I hope that never happens, but but we'll be able to move smoothly up up with the performance of the network. So, so it's sort of a safety feature. It's both a performance feature that we can go down and it's a safety feature that we can go up. Um, so you heard, you heard here first, folks, Algorand is now bomb proof. One second block <laughs> times are possible. Uh, Thanks to the magic of dynamic Lambos, love it. All right, well, let's transition. Let's let let's let's talk a little bit about uh, consensus consensus incentivization. There, uh, John. You know, why now? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 an interesting question. Uh, I think it's something that Algorand Technologies uh, folks like JJ, Gary, and and Silvio, and folks at the foundation had considered for a while. Um, it's something we are doing in lockstep. We're working together. I mean, you can see that we wrote the paper together, okay? Uh, which is a discussion paper on Algor on consensus incentives for Algorand. Um, there's also a video that uh, we will sh we, I've shared already, but we can share in, in the chat that uh, I walk through the main ideas in the paper, um, uh, which I co-authored. Um, but I would say that um, we're looking at ahead. We're looking at peer to peer, uh, which is Gary. As, uh, sorry, as JJ has already said, is very a very exciting shift. Uh, towards a hyper decentralized network, um, which will you know dovetail uh, well with all the technologies we, we've rolled out, like dynamic lambda. Um, and in 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 that environment, we want as many nodes uh, as possible out there that are uh, behaving 
uh, responsibly and are, are, are you know, well connected and, and doing consensus, uh, doing a good job at consensus. And also, if you look at the amount of algo being staked, it's about, I think, about 14% of all algo in, 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 in sorry, 14 percent of the 10 billion possible algo is currently being staked. Of course, the, uh, the actual supply is, is a little bit lower than, than 10. But we want to increase that. The more algo that's staked, the better, the better it is. Um, also, you know, at the moment, of course, the Algorand Foundation uh, gets involved staking some of its treasury in order to secure the chain. We want to minimize that. Again, moving towards decentralization, we don't want to have any say in block production. And so in order to do that, Empirically, we've seen that folks don't seem to be getting out there um, and getting involved with staking. Folks with like, you know, uh, four, eight, 10, 50,000 algo, 100,000 algo. Sure, we've got a lot of the big the big holders doing it, but we don't have those kind of medium-sized holders getting involved. Probably because, there, as I've said in the paper, there's some friction around running a computer 24-7 and taking the time to learn how to, how to set one of these things up. But the network is more decentralized. It's more secure with these folks getting involved. And we felt looking at the topology of the network and looking at the stake of the network and looking at the our future aspirations towards things like peer-to-peer, -peer, it made sense uh, to make a move and to start rewarding consensus and to get people more involved. And uh, finally, I would say that, um, as has been said already, uh, this will mean that uh, the two ways in which you can get involved and, and, and earn algo are either true XGovs, where you put a proposal and you will be uh, rewarded for that proposal and uh, for the execution of it, and also uh, for consensus operation. Um, and so this will bring an end to the era of uh, paying for governance votes. Governance votes will still exist, but it won't be a paid activity. And I think what we've really said there is that algo that's going to go out to, to the community anyway, it's now going to pay for the security of the network and the sustainability of the network rather than, say, uh, the activity of voting. And so we think it's the right the right path forward. Uh, JJ, what, what, anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I think that... The... The big, uh, the sea change, if you will, is that um, it was always sort of a bad idea to encourage um, um, the small guys to participate because the concern was always in the past, hold on, it won't be, um, it, it was always, oh, well, maybe they're not very interested in the project and they'll get bored and turn off their computer after they've registered to be online for the next six months. And so now their stake will never vote. And our consensus protocol demands that 80% of participants uh, vote properly. And so we're always a little bit reluctant. So part of um, what goes hand in hand with incentives is the ability to remove um, nodes who are not participating properly. Um, so there's there's both a mechanism where if you don't propose uh, as often as you should, um, with plenty of, uh, of of room for safety, or if you don't respond to a certain kind of network generated challenge, um, your state can be removed. And so now it's safe. Now it's safe to encourage people um, to to get online because if they drop offline, we'll we'll catch them and we'll and we'll remove them from online stake and we can keep moving forward. So that's what was holding incentives back in a lot of ways. We didn't want to apply incentives thereby encouraging people who might not be paying enough attention to participate. But now, if you don't pay attention, we'll notice and uh, it won't be a big problem, which makes us actually even safer than we used to be. Because it used to be, even our big stakeholders sometimes screw up. They kick the power on the plug, kick, kick the power on the computer, so to speak. Um, and then we're frantically trying to figure out who it is. That's not the way networks should work. We shouldn't have to pay attention to who who owns this stake, but we had to. We had to keep keep an eye on things. Like if, if some if a three percent node dropped off, we're like, oh, that's not going to hurt consensus yet. But we're we're worried, and we'd have to figure out, try and figure out who it is. Get call them up and say, hey, why aren't you fixing your node? Um, we're not going to have to do that anymore because if you're a three percent node, you should be voting uh, every thirty rounds or so. So every three hundred rounds or so, if you haven't voted, we can say what's wrong, something's wrong, and knock you off. Um, if, by the way, you're still there, there's plenty of ways to stay on. But so yeah. everything becomes much safer now, um, and that's why it's so reasonable to have incentives. You should have incentives. You're helping you're helping their network run. There's fees being paid. Why shouldn't you get some of those fees for accomplishing what the network is being paid to do? Right. Of course. Are there disincentives here? Is there slashing involved? Like if in the, if that three percent no. node goes offline, they don't get slashed, right? They there's just, like they just the go tiniest offline. thing that there's this this tiniest thing that if. Uh, to, to prevent a, a really like pathological case. So in order to say that you want incentives, um, you need to pay an extra couple algos when, when you key reg. So if you do a normal key reg exactly as you did in the past, you won't receive incentives. Instead, you have to say, 
I'm interested in incentives and therefore I'm going to pay, I think it's going to be something like two or five algos, some, some relatively small amount that you'll earn back quickly. Um, if we have to suspend you because you weren't there, um, then uh, we sort of mark your account and we say that if you want to come back online again, you're going to have to pay that again. But normally you would not have to keep paying that. In order to stay online, you would key register the next time through and we wouldn't ask for that to, uh, to you to kick in again. So this All is right. just to prevent uh, the kind of node that would go online every day, get suspended at night because they turn off their computer and then come on the next day. We want to make that, uh, we want to sort of little bits make you not do that. We're never going to slash that. We're not going to take your algos from you. Um, we're just going to say, look, we had to suspend you. So if you want back on, you're going to pay a couple extra algos. Right, um, you'll sense. earn it back if you're a good guy. Um, so. And then the the pool for this incentivization, John, is this being, um, do we see the uh, amount of XGovs uh, decrease to allow incentivizations to come so that we still have uh, the, this this single pie or is uh, or is there is there an additional pool of tokens for incentivization specifically? Yeah, so the so I was kind of outlined in the paper the the which of course everyone may not have read uh, the the pool is going to be the fees that are generated by by transactions and that is you know volume of transactions multiplied by 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 fee of course and we hope uh, you know, I mean, I don't know. I'm going to check what it is right now. Uh, like right, well, like you know, a year and a half ago when I started, it was like we had seven TPS or eight mm -hmm. TPS at that time. We have 162 right now, as I look on the ten, the ten block average is 163 right this second. And so we are seeing increases in volume, and yes. that's great. And so there's more fees being generated today than ever before. Uh, well, not ever before I can say that, but certainly uh, than when I've been here uh, when I joined. And so. Over time, the fees will become more meaningful. Maybe we'll increase fees uh, in some slightly substantive way. Never to the point, by the way, that it costs dollars to send, uh, but where it may be cents rather than fractions of a cent. And by doing that, we we create an, an economic environment where uh, the security of the network is sustained, uh, you know, uh, persistently. And so, doesn't require the foundation. Doesn't require relays. Doesn't because you have peer to peer. Doesn't re uh, you know uh, re require. Um, staking by 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 large holders. Instead, it can be sustained by the community, by the person on the street. And so that's where we need to get to in terms of how do we pay for that in, in the short term. So in the short term, there isn't enough fees, I, in our view, to, to uh, meaningfully increase the amount of stake there and the amount of nodes. And so the foundation will be, in addition to the fees, transferring a large sum of algo um, which is still being worked out, but it will be in you know um, hundreds of millions of algo to put to put a ballpark figure on it um, to the to a especially designated account on on the on the chain where the protocol will take over and then pay that out to people who propose who propose blocks and so. Where does that money come from? Well, uh, a portion, a, a, a chunk of it will certainly come from the original governance pot, which was being used uh, to pay for, for voting, but it won't affect XGOVs. So XGOVs is its own little kind of slice of the world. Uh, XGOVs, of course, for, as pe people may or may not know, is similar to Catalyst on Cardano. It's this idea that you can submit a proposal and you get rewarded uh, for delivering on some technical benefit to, to the ecosystem um, or some project or some product for the ecosystem. And so we have both of these things in tandem. We have both the chunk for consensus incentives to, su to supplement uh, the fees until uh, we get to a place where they're more substantive. And we have XGovs as a separate as a separate slice. The only thing that will be ending is the original style governance um, rewards. Um, okay. And finally, um, I might say that, you know, as kind of as per the paper, we've defined this emission curve um, mm -hmm. that describes the payout over time over, over various blocks. It's kind of a, a, a kind of a sloped exponential. And what it's basically saying is there will be this additional supplementary reward, which by the way, as the recipient of this reward, when you produce a block, you get one payment. You don't get like two different payments. You get like one single payment. But this additional amount of money that's supplementing the fees will decay over time. So it starts off quite high for the first, you know, whatever number of months. And then over the course of say two, two and a half years, it will slowly tend, tend down. Right. And so that's natural because we want to be in a place in two, two and a half years where the fees themselves are substantive enough to secure the network meaningfully. Right, makes sense. Yeah, so so, so looking to looking to have a sustainable model uh, deployed here. Appreciate that. Uh, wondering, uh, th th there's been some question about, well, would we need to move to an, an inflationary algo in terms of the, the, the fixed supply, the fixed cap of uh, of the core token algo? Is is that something that uh, could be considered? I mean, it's fixed in code, right? 
it's fixed in code, just like Bitcoin's is. And just like Bitcoin's, it could be changed. Um, again, it would require voting in by by all of the nodes. It would be something that would have to be literally uh, a, a change that was that was that was voted in. I would say it's not something that the foundation are looking at. Um, it's not something that, uh, as, I'm, as far as I'm aware, that the, the te- Algorand Technologies are looking at. Um, but it, 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 this only came to light recently because it was proposed by uh, you know one of our one of our very prominent community members, John, who wrote wrote a thesis around. The, you know, sustainability for, for Algorand. And one of his maybe more provocative suggestions in, in that piece was that you could on, on, on cap the, the supply of Algorand. But it's not something that we are actively looking at. But uh, there are uh, cryptocurrencies that have done this um, in the past. And so it's not unprecedented, but um, there's no there's no current plans to do so. Good. Appreciate that. All right. Well, let's let's switch gears a little bit. Um, still talking about decentralization, but let's talk about this migration towards uh, a P2P gossip network, right? With the uh, expected increase in decentralization that these networks will enjoy as a result. So JJ, maybe you can briefly describe kind of what does the Algorand network topology look like today with relays? What does that mean? And then uh, John, maybe I'll have you describe a little bit about what uh, the peer-to-peer network will become. Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the current uh, topology is, is really simple. Um, there are a set of nodes that are called relays. They're listed in a DNS entry. And so um, anyone in the world can find out who they are by, by performing a DNS lookup. And those nodes are configured to accept connections from a large number of, uh, let's call them edge algo nodes, uh, algo D nodes. And so Every algo, essentially, except for those relays, every algo D node in the world connects to a, a more than one uh, relay. Um, one of these, uh, well, I don't know how many there are right now, 50 or there, there could be 100 or I really don't know. Um, but there are enough of them that all of the algo D nodes in the world connect to them and them only. Um, and so people have uh, been concerned. Doesn't that mean Algorand is uh, centralized? You said you had to use DNS. Well, who controls that DNS? Who decides who gets to be uh, a relay? Currently, um, the, the Algorand Foundation does decide who gets to be a relay. Um, so the first thing that peer to peer is going to do is going to let people say, does anyone else want to be a relay? If so, I'll try connecting to you. If you give me good information, great. Um, if you don't, those other relays are still there. So that's great. Um, so peer to peer, it doesn't force you to use um, other paths to get transactions, but it allows it. And so that's, that's to my mind, that's what's important about decentralization. It's not necessarily that the transactions usually flow through an alternate path that, that doesn't involve relays. It's that if they aren't flowing through the relays, they can flow through a decentralized um, set of uh, participants. Um, so those relays will, uh, at least some, in some form, will continue to exist, be out there and participate in the peer-to-peer protocol. Um, but again, were they to be all hit by bombs simultaneously, um, we'd be able to go, go around them. Great. John, so, so introduce us to P2P. What, what, what does that mean? What does that look like from a network standpoint? Sure. By the way, I've had a, a, a little invader in my house here has come into my room. So I'm here with my, so just, you gotta be quiet. <laughs> it's like the BBC moment. Um, okay. So, um, okay. Very good. Um, so uh, peer-to-peer, w- you know, what is a blockchain, right? It's uh, a database that's shared by a whole bunch of different computers. Um, those computers are running a software we call the node, but, it, you know, it could be a Mortal Kombat client, right? It's just a bunch of connected computers um, that are running an algorithm to keep uh, parity in the database. And so by definition, we need these computers to talk to each other. And so uh, we call that the data propagation model. Uh, you know, how does data flow from one of, from one computer to the other? Of course, using the internet, but, um, uh, you know, at, at a fundamental level. But if you look at, like, what we call the network topology that sits on top of that, as JJ's already alluded, um, right now we have this idea of, like, this, like, superhighway of, like, nodes called relays. And inside the city, you've got, like, the participation nodes. So they're doing their job. They're, they're being hit with transactions. They're validating them. They're doing consensus. And then they don't talk to each other, right? They're not the, the, the citizens of the city don't talk to each other. They talk to the high-speed ring road, right, around the city. And so that's what propagates the data. Um, and so, we're, you know, that is a very efficient network topology, and there's, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with it. But it, but in its current form, uh, where the Algorand Foundation is paying entities out there, and they are known entities, you know, Pure Stake, Block Demon, uh, there are many of them. There's about uh, 12, 15 of them. Some of them are private companies. Some of them are private individuals. Some of them are... 
uh, early backers. There's there's loads of different uh, categories of people who are who are still involved in this, but ultimately, they are being paid to run this these relay networks, and so. It has its virtues, but it's not as decentralized as we'd like it to be. Just like the developer experience was capable, but it wasn't uh, as great as we wanted it to be. And that's why we did AlgoKid. And so because of this, we're doing peer-to-peer. And what does peer-to-peer mean? It means that we are adding a new network topology. We're changing the network topology, rather, so that now uh, the citizens inside the city can talk to each other directly. And there are, like just like a neural network, many pathways uh, to, to communicate between each one of the participation nodes. And so what this essentially does, as JJ also said earlier, is it makes the network, uh, you know, bomb proof in a way, because uh, if, if, a, if if right now, if all the if 100 relays go down, you've got a problem with the network. Um, if half the relays just drop off, you've got a problem with the network. Instead, if you've also got the option to propagate data and communicate peer to peer, then it's 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 nearly impossible to bring down a network like that, because from a day from a data pro- point of view, because there's always a pathway from one part of the network to the other. You just have to skirt along uh, through different participants. And so uh, I think if you look at the strongest, most decentralized networks out there, uh, Bitcoin is, is one, Monero is another, uh, Ethereum is another, they all tend to use uh, peer-to-peer data propagation. And uh, we're adding it to Algorand because we want to maximize decentralization and maximize optionality. And I think alongside consensus incentives, alongside AlgoKit 3, uh, alongside um, a dynamic lambda and indeed uh, the light relays that we're that we're rolling out. Um, it's a very good year to be uh, working within and working with Algorand. Appreciate that. Absolutely, I feel it. Uh, Alessandro, I'm gonna I'm gonna look to you. So th- these guys have been talking about network topology and and all sorts of stuff for a while here, right? We're, 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 we're devs, right? We compare. We're really concerned about the APIs, right? Like, how how am I going to get my data from the ledger, right? So those REST APIs that the AlgoD also provides. What impact are, you know, what these guys are talking about in this P2P network thing? How does that impact the REST API endpoints in my code and my applications that are currently deployed? Realistically, the change happens behind the scene. So developers shouldn't see any disruption whatsoever. Clean, simple. All right. That's exactly what we want to hear. Wonderful. All right, well, we're, we're, we're coming to the end here, so... Um, we Brian, probably... can I just take which is one moment? Because I've had a lot of people say about my hat. Um, and my hat is, is not possible to buy. Uh, I seen someone earlier say, Etsy, you're not going to find it on Etsy. You're not going to find it on Redbubble. It's not possible. Um, folks at the Inc. have commented on it. The community's commented on it. I am willing to auction off my hat. Um, and I'll give half the proceeds to a good charity. Um, I'm going to come out with a number, but I think maybe something like 10 million algo is reasonable. And so, I don't know, I'll, I'll roll something out soon, but you're going to have the opportunity to buy this hat to one lucky, very rich individual. Love it. Can't Can wait. I get a cut of the other half of the proceeds? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding before I get I get slaughtered on social media for that. No, I'm just kidding. I might give it away, though. I might give it away. I think so. Well, uh, there's there might be an opportunity, right? We've got this, uh, we got to, we got this Decipher event coming up in Barcelona at the end of June, right? So... We're coming back with the cipher. Uh, this time, it's going to be very much uh, dev focused, and we are going to release some information on that in the weeks ahead. So make sure that you are on the lookout for that, and we look forward to uh, seeing our devs there. Um, I think that's gonna that's gonna wrap up kind of where we are on that roadmap here today. I really appreciate you guys coming together with me here and uh, taking a look through everything that was on the Algorand Gambit and the Algorand 2024 roadmap to the community. I certainly hope that we answered your questions sufficiently. And as always, be sure that you keep connected with us on Discord. That is discord.gg slash Algorand. And make sure that you sign up on our Algorand developer portal so that you can learn how to develop efficient smart contracts on the Algorand blockchain. That is developer.algorand.org. And finally, make sure that you are subscribed to this here YouTube channel, this uh, AlgoDevs YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at AlgoDevs. All right. Uh, yeah, so to all of you devs out there, uh, hope that you will continue to uh, build here on Algorand. Let's give a, a gracious thank you to our guests here, uh, JJ, John, and Alessandro. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Carlos. It's been fun. Thank you.
All right, let's do it again. Uh, you guys willing to come back maybe uh, mid year and kind of give us an update on uh, what's what's no, transpired no, since? No, no, no. no? <laughs> JJ's not invited. All right, all right. <laughs> Alessandro, I'm holding. I'll you. be here. I'll be here. Yeah, all I'm, right. I'm, 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 anytime. anytime. I've got no choice. <laughs> really appreciate you guys being here. Thanks once again, and to everybody, have fun building.